Today is the uh, 21st of February 1994 and today I want to take up this vitally important subject of relationships which technically is the subject of bonding so the, the lecture will be entitled bonding but the material it covers will be this in this subject of relationships first off uh, we need to discover what a relationship is well fundamentally a relationship is a connection is a connection when we say uh, when we say two things are related, we, we, we only really mean fundamentally that, the, that there's a connection between them. For example, in our society, there's clearly a connection between um, a person who wears a dress and a girl. These, these two things are are connected in our society and so we say they are related the, the, the concept of relationship and, and connectivity is, is quite interchangeable if, if two things are connected then they are related and if two things are related then they are connected uh, it, it, it's, uh, it, it's a two way it's a two way proposition you can't have one without the other on the other hand um, there doesn't appear to be any relationship between the subject of Eskimo's breakfast and Beethoven's symphonies. So we would say that these two things are unrelated, and so they are unconnected. Now the first thing we need to know about a relationship is that it's always between two or more things. A thing cannot be related to itself in isolation. You see that? So that, that's absolutely fundamental to, to the idea of a relationship. There's always two things or more things involved. I mean, three things can all be related to each other. But uh, when you examine these complex relationships, they can always be any complex relationship of, of more than two things. When, when all say you've got three things and they're all related to each other, they're all connected to each other. Um, you can always break these, this connectivity down into a series of pairs. You know, if you get A, B, and C are related to each other, well, you can break it down to the relationship between A and B and between A and C and the relationship between B and C. So you can always break it down into a series of pairs. So a fundamental relationship is, is always a, a, a relationship of, of a pair, one thing to another. And, but certainly a thing cannot have a relationship with itself. Now the next thing we need to know about a relationship is that all relationships are achieved by postulates. All relationships are achieved by postulates. One, things are related one to the other by making postulates. Now if you don't understand that, you, you, you'll park yourself right here on the subject of relationships. You, you've got to get that. It's done by postulates. It's all done. It's all done by postulates. Well, as we already know that, that this universe only consists of life and postulates, it's no great surprise to us to discover that all relationships are achieved by postulates, is it? But nevertheless, you better you better you better grasp this. Now, in life, in life and livingness there is a, a vast number of ways in which a relationship can be postulated. In other words, the relationship postulate can occur in many, many ways in, in life. I won't bother to classify them. I haven't bothered to classify them. There's no need for you to classify them. But I can assure you that uh, it's a considerable number of ways. I'll give you some examples of, of the diversity of relationship postulates, and you'll, 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 you'll see what I mean. In the, old, in the Old Testament of the Bible, it is said that, uh, that God said, let there be light. Now, let there be light doesn't sound like a relationship postulate but uh, in fact as a matter of fact it is it, it is a relationship postulate it's not a postulate in isolation because what God intended according to the Old Testament was that light should occur in the universe so we have the two things we have the universe and we have we have light 
so really what God was saying the type of postulate he was saying was that, um, that if the universe exists then light will, will exist that's really what he was saying that uh, if the universe exists then, then, then light exists he may have expressed the postulate as let there be light but uh, that is what he meant <laughs> he meant that uh, granting that the universe exists and the universe d d does exist then there, there will be light in the universe in other words he was saying if the universe exists then light exists in that universe if universe then light that's what he was saying so that there's see, there's an example there of a, of, a, of, a, of a relationship which doesn't obviously appear to be a relationship when you say the postulate let there be light it doesn't immediately appear that it's relationship postulate yet it is it's a relationship postulate All right, I'll give you another example and this is possibly a more obvious example a man says I love Mary well now that's a relationship postulate we've got the subject of him we've got the subject of love and we've got the subject of Mary there's actually three things in this uh, in this situation and he's connecting them up in a, in, in a manner which says that uh, I love Mary another way to express this postulate I love Mary would be to say that um, Mary is within the class of people that I love you see that now that's a very precise way of uh, expressing the postulate but people don't normally say that in, in conversation they, the man would say well I love Mary he wouldn't say that Mary is within the class of people that I love he wouldn't say that but nevertheless the, the latter is the more precise way to to, to, to express the postulate right, let's, let's, let's give another example of a relationship a person says to, him, says to himself or says to the world at large or to all, all, all people who wear dresses are girls See that? Well, that definitely is a relationship postulate. And uh, we could express that in another way by saying that uh, he, his postulate is that if girls exist, sorry, if people who wear dresses exist, then girls exist. That's another way of expressing that, you see. When you come to examine this subject of relationships and the nature of these various relationship postulates, and they will come up, they will come up in therapy. Don't don't, don't kid yourself on this subject. They're going to going to show up in droves as, as you start working working in therapy, particularly at the upper levels, levels four and five. You're going to get these relationship postulates going to start coming up, and. Um, You'll, you'll be struck by the diversity of these postulates and you'll be also be struck and say to yourself wouldn't it be nice wouldn't it be lovely if there was a standard that every relationship postulate could be reduced to a standard form a standard standard type of postulate which means exactly the same as the as the one that uh, I, I find in my mind well is that possible in other words, can we can we standardise all all relationship postulates and put them into a into a into a certain form? Yes, we can. We we can do this. But before I talk, talk about this, um, I'll, I'll have to we'll have to talk a little bit about logic, a little bit about the subject of logic. In the uh, in the field of logic, this subject of uh, of how to express relationships between uh, between things is, was a, was a great problem for many many years. They too were struck by the diversity of of the relationships, the, the way that relationships could. Logicians were struck by the diversity in the way that relationships could exist between things, and they too looked for a standardised uh, standard form of the relationship postulate although they didn't call it a relationship postulate, they simply were looking for a, a standardised form of relationship. They were looking for something which, no matter what they found in the real universe, what the relationship was, no matter how it expressed itself in the real universe, it could be broken down into, into some simplicity and so it could be used in a logical system. And eventually they found what they called the fundamental logical relationship that any relationship between things in the universe can be broken down into this simplicity and thus thus understood 
must standardized and, and understood in the terms of the simplicity. Now, when we search for a standardization of relationship, of the relationship postulates, standardized, there's absolutely no reason why we shouldn't use the same standard, standard form that the logician uses. I mean, the, the logicians went to great lengths to, uh, to discover the fundamental relationship postulate. And there's no reason why we shouldn't use it. it well, to put it another way round, <laughs> we couldn't do any better. If no matter how we 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 uh, we worked at the subject of, of relationship postulates and standardise them, try to sta class first of all classify them and then standardise them, we'd eventually end up with the same postulate that the, that the logicians ended up with. I can assure you of that. We wouldn't come up with anything new. There is only in this universe. There's only one fundamental relationship postulate, and that's the one the the, the logicians use. Life doesn't use it very much. It, use, it, it can use something very similar to it, life does, but it doesn't use it very much. But it's lovely to be able to convert any relationship you find in the mind into the standard form. But you might say, does any advantage accrue to taking a relationship in the mind and, and, um, and reducing it to a standardized form, to a standard form? Does any, yes, considerable advantages accrue which you don't know, notice, don't know about until you actually do the, uh, you actually do the reduction, do the standardization. Once you, once you, you take this relationship, and reduce it to the standard form. You're then in a position to learn much, much more about that relationship than you could ever learn while it was in the non-standardized form. In other words, there's tremendous advantages to be gained by taking the relationships in, as they as they appear in the mind and reducing them to the standard form. The standard form. Now, what is this standard form of a relationship? Well, before I give you that st the standard form. We'll have to talk, unfortunately, just a little bit about uh, about the logic of classes. Um, we won't have to go very much into it, but um, unless I give you a, a, a few of the basics of the subject of the logic of classes, you won't see the advantages of putting a relationship into its into its basic logical form. So we'll better talk about this a little bit about the about the logic of classes and then you'll see the, the, the enormous advantages that accrue by using the using the logical form of relationships. Well first of all we we better briefly say well what is a what is a class? We'd better make some definitions here otherwise we're going to get into a frightful mess if we don't define a few terms. And all these terms are going to be used later in the lecture so you better cock your ears up. They're not complicated terms, but we've got to define them. First of all, what is a class? Well, a class is best defined, and this is as good a definition as any, although you, you may find a more precise definitions in, uh, in logical textbooks, but just for our purposes, a class, and it's as good a definition as any, a class can be defined as a group Whose, whose members each have one or more things in common. A group whose members have one or more things in common. Now, for example, the uh, men. Men are a class. They are, they are a class of beings. Are men. They all, they all have in common uh, masculinity. They all, all have masculinity in common. They may have many other things in common, the class of men, but they, at least they have that in common. So that, uh, that that is sufficient to to designate them as a class, and they've all got masculinity in common. Right? That's so much for a class. That's a simple enough. Uh, it's a simple enough definition. Now the next thing is a common class. A common class is best defined as a uh, a class which consists of two or more classes. For example. Uh, a common class would be the class of black men. Now here we have the class of black, black beings. That would be a distinct class in the universe. Black beings and uh, men is a class in the universe. Class of men. 
that the, the common class of black men they possess the uh, they have in common that they're men and uh, they also have in common that they're black they're black beings so they're, they're, they're both men and black beings you see so they're, they're black men we would say that this is the class of black men you see that now that's a common class a more complex common class would be black men over six foot tall they would have in common each one each member of this class would be a black being would be a man and would be over six foot tall see that so that would be black black men over six foot tall will be the common class of black men over six foot tall again it's quite a straightforward uh, it's quite a straightforward system now the uh, the, the, the next uh, next definition I want to give you and this is a very very important one is the concept of the null class null class n u double l null the word null comes from the latin nullus meaning not any so it's no surprise to discover that the a null class is a, is a class that's empty that has no members in it so that is what a, that is what a null class is it's a, it's an empty class has no members in it. I'll give you a couple of examples of, uh, of empty classes, null classes. Uh, the class of green cats is, uh, is a null class. <coughs> Excuse me. The class of green things is, uh, is a well populated class. There's plenty of things in this universe that are green. And the class of cats is a well defined class. But the class, the common class of uh, of green cats is null. Cats, evidently, for some reason best known to themselves, don't come out on the in the colour green. So you, you won't find, although you'll find plenty of cats about and plenty of green objects about, green things about, you won't find any green cats. Green cats is a null class. So, and another example of a of a uh, of a null class would be. Uh, uh, will be crows, the, the common class of crows that are non-birds. You see, that's, that too is a null class, it's an empty class. Crows that are non-birds. There's plenty of things in the universe that, um, plenty of crows about, and there's plenty of things in the universe that aren't birds. But there's, there's the, the class of things that are both, uh, both crows and non-birds does not exist. There aren't, any, there aren't any crows that are non-birds. The reason why there aren't any crows that are non-birds is because all, all crows are birds, you see. So the, if, if all crows are birds, and in this universe all crows are birds, then uh, the, 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 the common class of crows that are non-birds does not exist. So again, that is a, a null class, you see that. So. One must be, be wary of uh, making permutations and combinations of classes. It's quite all right to do this, but uh, you can't always be sure that, you, that the, the classes that you arrive at when you start combining these classes are, are random, although the, the, the classes, each individual class you, you specify may have members in it, you can't be sure that your common class that you end up with is going to have members in it. It may be a null class. You would have to test it. In other words, there may be postulates in the universe which, uh, which, which make your your uh, your class that you've arrived at into a null class. You see that? So, so to, don't don't always assume. You mustn't always assume that, that all classes have got members in. There's quite a lot of null classes in this universe. Quite a lot of them. Right, well, so far so good. We're getting on very, 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 very well here. We've defined uh, a relationship. We've defined a class. We've defined a common class. And we've defined a null class. We're, we're getting on very, very well. We're now in a position to, to specify the basic bonding relationship postulate in the field of logic. Now, this, this postulate... Uh, is the, the what in simplest form is the postulate of if A then B. That is the, the basic form of the postulate. If A then B. Now what do we mean when we say if A then B? Well we simply mean that if A exists then B exists. 
that's what we mean fundamentally that if I exist then B exists that is our postulate our postulate is determined to make this so that is what we're postulating when we say if A then B we are saying that if A exists then B exists I want to put it another way that every time we see A we will see B every time we see A we will see B now, the postulate does not say, when we say if A then B, the postulate doesn't say that A exists. It says if A exists, it's conditional, if A exists, then B exists. Right? So it's, uh, it's not, when you say if A then B, it's not quite the same as saying all A's are B. See that? In certain specified instances, all, all A's of B may be the same as if A then B. Let's give you an example here to differentiate those two out. Um, in this universe, all crows are birds. You could postulate all crows are birds, okay? That, that's true, that, that's true. All crows are birds in this universe. They all, obey, they all obey that postulate. There's a postulate there. I don't know who made the postulate, whether the birds made it or whether God made it, we're not concerned who made the postulate, but the postulate exists in the universe, all crows are birds. Now we can express that as, uh, but this, this postulate says that all crows are birds implies that crows exist, you see. When you say all crows are birds, there's imp this implication that uh, crows exist. But, but when we say, if crow, then bird, there is no such implication. So it's a much more precise postulate. But it means the same thing. It means if crow then bird means exactly the same thing as all crows are birds. The only difference is that all crows, all crows are birds implies that crows exist. Um, and because crows exist, birds exist. If crow then bird. But when we say if crow then bird... This is a conditional postulate. We don't not saying that uh, that crows exist, but but if the crows do exist, and we don't we, we, we don't know whether they exist or not, but if, if a crow exists, then it's a bird. But of course, there may not be any crows at all. So our our postulate: if crow if crow then bird, if crows then birds, or if crow then bird, can exist in a universe where there's no crows and no birds. You see. <laughs> where the postulate all crows are birds does really need the existence of crows and therefore the existence of birds to, to, to put itself into action but the postulate if crow then bird can exist in a universe where there's no crows and no birds is simply a postulate, simply a relationship it just says if crows exist then birds exist now you see the difference between the two you see that if crow then bird is a much more fundamental way to express the postulate because it doesn't require the existence of the of the junior universes of crows birds or whatever they happen whatever i and b happen happen to happen to be in the in the situation we're considering see that so the most fundamental expression of it is if a then b now in the field of logic you might be interested to know this that any logical proposition or proposition no matter how complex you can have a, a you can have a, a, a no matter how complex the the propositions are the logical propositions are they can be broken down into a series of if a then b propositions and this is true in the field of logic you can have something as complex say as the uh, as the programming of a, of a of a mighty computer and that has may maybe have millions even billions of relationships in its in its memory bank but um, this whole mishmash of relationships could if you wanted to would spend spend the time at it you could break it down into a series of if a then b relationships if a then b bondings you see that or to put it another way, you can build up, <coughs> no matter how complex your relationships you want in your computer, you can build them up to any great complexity in terms of if A then B postulates. You just keep feeding if A then B postulates into the computer and you'll end up with, <laughs> with, with any degree of complexity that you desire in your, in your memory bank or in your postulate structure, in your program of your, of your, of your computer. You see? 
So it doesn't matter how, the compl how complex it is. It's two, it, it, it goes two ways. You can build up complicated postulate structures, <coughs> com pro complex uh, relationship postulates from the simple if A then Bs, or you can break down the complex ones into their, into their uh, if A then B parts. You see that? Go either way. Go from simplicity to complexity, and then break the complexity back to the simplicity. Now you're beginning to see that there's some advantage to using using the logical system over dealing with all these different types of relationship processes that we find in life. Already we're beginning to see advantages, aren't we? See that we can break down a complexity into a simplicity and go from a simplicity to a complexity by using this uh, using the system, using the A then B system, which we can't do on on, on another system. But anyway, I, I, I thought I'd mention that to you, and it's no different than the human mind. No matter how complex the relationships are in the human psyche, they can all, each and every one of them, can be broken down into a series of if A then B relationships, and can be utilised as such. And strangely enough, once you break them down into if A then B relationships, they can be utilised and can be and can be manipulated in an logical system, if you if you wish, because the logic, um, the logicians have, 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 have developed their subject to a point where you can manipulate these if A then B postures within within a system and come out with deductions and so forth. But before you can use the system of the logicians, you've got to put your postulates in the form, your relationships in the form that, that the systems can handle, and the logical systems can handle if A then B postulates. <laughs> because all, all, all logic, that's the basis of all relationships, you see. So that any logical system can handle an if A then B postulate. <laughs> So you get your life and living as postulates, once you've reduced them down to if A then B, types of postulates, they can be manipulated in a logical system. That's another advantage of doing this. You might not want to do so, but uh, you can do so once you've, uh, once you've reduced them down to this simplicity. So again, we're seeing there's, a, there's more advantages occurring here. It's beginning to look good, isn't it? Beginning to look good. Now, what is the effect of making an if A then B postulate? And now we're beginning to get into an area where you're really begin to see the advantages of going into the simplicity of an if A then B <coughs> rather than dealing with the complexity of the relationship postulates in the, in the human mind. The, the advantage of converting these complex relationship postulates in the mind into the simple postulates of if A then B. What is the effect of an if A then B postulate? Well we know that all postulates limit freedom. Every postulate. That's, you'll, you'll find that that's in one of the earlier supplementary lectures. It's, it's in the definition. It's in a very, 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 very early definitions. That that is it applies in the universe. That um, remember when I said that uh, when I said that all all postulates limit the possible and thereby define the reasonable. All postulates limit the possible and thereby define the reasonable. Well, a relationship postulate is no exception to this rule. It's a postulate, so it limits limits the possible. In other words, it results, like any postulate, in a lowering of freedom of choice. Well, let's examine an if A then B postulate and see what and how this comes about and just what freedom of choice is lost when you make an if A then B postulate. So let's take, for example, the, the postulate, the relationship postulate, uh, if crow, then bird. Now, what freedom is lost in that area? Well, when we say, if crow, then bird, we are saying that this common class that are both crows and non-birds does not exist. I'll give it to you again. When we say if crow then bird, make the postulate if crow then bird, we are saying that this common class, that is both a crow and a non bird, does not exist. It's a null class. And that, so help me, 
is the only effect of the if grow then bird postulate. It has no other effect. It simply empties that class. So you lose a, you lose one of the possible classes on the subject when you say if crow then bird. You've you've lost you've lost some freedom here. Well, let's have a look and examine what freedom you've lost. Well, now there's there's this little thing called a uh, a postulate set here. There's this subject of crows, this class of crows, and this class of birds. Well, we already know that. Um, there's four, poss four possible permutations between the subject of crows and birds. Uh, um, there's this class of things that are both crows and birds, and there's a class of things that are crows and not birds, and there's a class of things that are non-crows and birds, and there's a class of things which are neither crows nor birds. And that, the, the, the totality of those, the sum of those four classes constitutes the whole universe. And we call this a, 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 a set, a set, a postulate set. It's a set of the postulates. That they're, they're, remember, we I've used the word postulate set when dealing with uh, the postulates of the goals packages. But these are also, it's still a postulate set, but we're using the postulates, the relationship postulate. So we can still call it a postulate set, or loosely we'd simply call it a set. But it's, it's essentially it's a still a postulate set. So there's four classes in the set. There, there's the, the class of crow, both crows and birds, both crows and non-birds, both non-crows and birds, both non-crows and non-birds. And when we say if crow then bird, we've taken this class of that is both a crow and a non-bird and reduced it to a null class. So now we've only in our universe now we haven't got four classes. The universe now has only got three classes. We've got the class that is both a crow and a bird, the class that is neither a crow and a bird, or a class that is neither a crow nor a bird. And that's and that's what it looks like in this universe. Because it happens to be true in the real universe that that if crow then bird is a, is a true postulate and the universe subscribes to that postulate it's true in the universe there's only those three classes extant the fourth class class of, of creatures that are both crows and non-birds don't exist they don't exist because the postulate if crow then bird reduces that class to a null class do you follow? so there's the freedom that's lost now, this is sneaky, isn't it? This is sneaky. If you've been following this, you, you'll realise that you can lose freedom by making relationship postulates. Every time you make a relationship postulate, you've lost a little bit of freedom. Now, that is something worth knowing, isn't it? You know, when you go, and go around relating one thing to another, no matter how you do it, once you've related one thing to another, once you've connected two things together, no matter how you've done it, no matter what you call this relationship postulate, fundamentally you're going to have lost some freedom. That's going to be easily demonstrated by converting your, your relationship postulate into the form of A then B and seeing which, and seeing which member of the set has gone. <laughs> one of the members of the set will have gone would have been reduced to a null class because of your if A then B postulate. You see that? So there's a distinct relationship between relationships and freedom. Every relationship that is made is a loss of some freedom of choice. And that is the datum. And it's a very, very important datum. A vitally important datum on the subject of relationships. You better know that one. You better know that one. That is the liability of making relationship postulates. Because every time you make a relationship postulate, you've lost a little freedom of choice. And you haven't. It's not obvious, is it? Not obvious. A child may postulate, or a young man or a child may postulate, or all those, all people who wear dresses are girls. Now, it may not be obvious to him, but he's sitting now in his own mind. He's, he's now... <laughs> lost a bit of freedom 
you can no longer now have a class of, of a person who wears a dress that isn't a girl. That, that class is now a null class in his mind. It's an empty class. He can't have that class anymore. All the other three classes in the set, and I won't specify them, I'll leave it as an exercise for you. The three other classes in the set that can exist in his universe, but that fourth class that is a, of a person, that is both a person who wears a dress and is not a girl, that, that class can't exist in his mind. There's no such animal, he'll say, once he makes the postulate. If person wearing a dress, then girl. Once he's made that postulate, the class of people who wear dresses that are non-girls don't exist in this class. There's no such animal as far as he's concerned. And he'll stand you out if you argue or talk to him on the subject. He'll say that they don't exist. He'll just simply justify and rationalise his postulate. His postulate. You see that? So, bear in mind, you can lose all the freedom there is in this universe by injudiciously making relationship postulates. By the injudicious use of making of relationship postulates, you can lose all the freedom there is in this universe, and you can dig yourself into a hole and jump into it. Now, you should understand that about relationships. Relationship postulates, very, very important, you see. It is an important subject, isn't it? It's a very important subject, relationships. Well, now, if you're going to convert all your... Uh, relationship postulates you come across in your mind into the form of A then B, you better be very familiar with the what this postulate if A then B really means and so forth. Well I can give you a little example here, a little little something which will help you to understand something that will make it something graphic that will make it stick it in your mind for you so that you understand what we mean when we say if A then B. Supposing we live in a town and we see two men, A and B, and they have a tandem bicycle. And B always rides at the front of the bicycle. He's always at the front of the bicycle. And A always rides behind him at the back of the bicycle. Follow, follow that? Now, sometimes when we go out, we go out walking around the town, we see A and B on their tandem bicycle. They go past us, there's B driving it at the front, doing the steering, and there's A behind him. They're both going along. That's one possibility. Now, there's other times we go walk out around the town, we see B on the tandem bicycle all by himself of the front of it, he's, he's all by himself, and the, there's no A at the back, A's just not there, you see, so we can see that possibility. And other time we go out walking around the town, we don't see either of them, there's no, no A, no B, no tandem bicycle, you can see that. But the one thing we can't see is A and not B. Why can't we see A? and not be. Well, you can't drive a tandem bicycle from the back because you can't steer it. And A only rides at the back of the tandem bicycle. So if, if B doesn't, isn't there, we don't see B on the tandem bicycle, then we are sure as hell ain't going to see A. So, does that little ex does that example help you? There's, there's the three sets, you see, of the tandem bicycle. We, we either see both A and B, or we see B and not A, or we see neither A nor B. But we never see A and not B. And that's an, that's the, gives you a graphic example of an if A then B possibly in terms of the tandem bicycle. And the reason we never see if A, never see A and not B, is because if B is absent, then A is absent. Now that is a very important relationship. And we call that, 
If if not B, then not A. We call the re reverse proposition, or more precisely, the reverse interpretation. George Ball called it the reverse interpretation. Well, he's a good enough authority on the subject. We, we shall call call that the reverse interpretation. We've got an if A then B possible. If A then B, is tr if it. In other words, if A then B is true, then the reverse interpretation of that postulate is if not B, then not A. Now this is not, that's not a deduction. It's simply another way of saying the postulate. It's another way of saying if A then B is to say if not B, then not A. Another way to say that every time we see A on the, bi on the tandem bicycle, we see B on the tandem bicycle. Another way to say that is to say that when we don't see B on the tandem bicycle, we never see A. It means exactly the same thing. It's a reverse interpretation of the if A then B postulate. So bear that in mind. Every if A then B postulate has got its reverse interpretation, which is not a deduction. It's just simply another way of saying it. Another way of saying it. Well, in other words, we might instead of saying if A then B, we might just as well say if not B then not A. It means exactly the same thing. And the reverse interpretation of the postulate if not B then not A is if A then B. <laughs> See that? They, 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 they share that relationship. Those two postulates share that reverse relationship with each other. One is the reverse. One is the reverse relationship or the reverse interpretation of the other. Well, now I'm just looking at this, uh, looking at this tape. I see I'm getting towards the end of the, uh, of the slide, so we'll close off this side of the tape here. So just, uh, just spool the tape onto the end and flip, flip over to the other side. Here we are, back again on side two. All right, so much for the example of the two men on the tandem bicycle. I hope that helps you to understand the. Uh, understand what we mean when we we say if a then b you, you should by now if you've been following this have a pretty firm grasp of what we mean when we say if a then b now next i'd like to talk a little more of the subject of bonding and why we call a relationship a, b a bonding <coughs> well it's not immediately obvious why we call a relationship a bonding until you get into this subject of if a then b until you you, you see the the uh, the basic the basic relationship, the if A then B, which is the basic relationship. Once you get it down to this basic relationship, you, you, you see that uh, this connection between the relationship and the subject of bonding. Now, when we say if A then B, we are virtually bonding A to B. A is bonded to B. Take the example of the men on the tandem bicycle. Um, A B has no restriction. He he can he can appear or, or on the bicycle any time he wants to, can't he? He can drive the bicycle any time he wants, or not or not drive it. He has no restriction. But A is restricted. Once the poster, uh, if A then B is made, A is restricted. If A exists, then B exists, and that is a restriction. So the if A then put if then B postulate puts no restriction on B, but puts a restriction on A. In other words, but, but I, well, B can use the tandem bicycle any time he wants to, but I can only use the bicycle when B's using it. Get it? So you see that example is a good example. How useful that little example is of the tandem bicycle. It, it, it brings that to light and brings that forward very, very clearly. This, this fact of the bonding. That A is bonded to B, but B is not bonded to A which is true in any if A then B postulate. The bonding, when we say if A then B, the bonding is between A and B. There's no bonding between B and A when we say if A then B. A is stuck to B, but B isn't stuck to A because B is free. But A is, 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 is joined, is connected, and is dependent upon B. Now, that this subject of bonding is not immediately apparent when, you, when you're talking about sticking wallpaper on the walls. But it becomes very apparent <laughs> when, you, when you start getting down to the relationship postulates of, of if A then B. 
we stick a wallpaper on the wall and the wallpaper is, is stuck to the wall, is bonded to the wall, but the wall is also bonded to the wallpaper, isn't it? So we tend loosely in life when we think of bonding, we think of two things being bonded to each other. Well, that may be true for wallpaper and walls, but when it gets down to postulates and, and bits and pieces in the mind, we have to, we can't use this this this, this, this uh, we have to, can't use this rough look at it. We have to get down to more precision. And once we get down to the A then B postulate, we're getting very precise here. We see that uh, we can have situations where A is stuck to B, and B is not stuck to A. That's something which you can't have with wallpaper and walls, you see, but you can have in your own psyche. To give you another example of the of the sticky of the bonding effect, you you see it with a man who postulates uh, if person wearing dress, then girl. Now, such a man can think of a girl without necessarily thinking of a person who is wearing a dress. He may think of a person who is wearing a dress when he thinks of a girl, or he may not think of a person who wears a dress when he thinks of a girl. But such a man cannot think of a person who's wearing a dress without thinking of a girl. Now you see which way around the bonding is. The bonding is between a person who wears a dress and a girl. There's no bonding between the girl and a person who wears a dress in his mind. In other words, in his mind, the subject of people who wear dresses is stuck to the subject of girls. But in his mind, the subject of girls is not stuck to the subject of people who wear dresses. Mm -hmm. There's a general rule of thumb to help you to remember the if A then B relationship, which way round it is, that in the if A then B relationship, the front end of the relationship is stuck to the back end of the relationship. But the back end of the relationship is not stuck to the front end of the relationship. Now that's true for, for any if A then B relationship. But when you when you thoroughly grasp this, you'll you'll see that see why that why we say that the technical subject of the subject of relationships is the subject of bonding. The, the technical subject is the subject of bonding, and uh, you you should cons start to think of relationships in terms of bondings. When you start thinking about relationships in terms of bondings, you begin to really understand them. Leave the subject of relationships to the to the psychoanalysts and the politicians and the sociologists who, who like to skid over the surface of these things and just take rather a casual look. But when you want to get down to real precision, as you need to do if you're going to take your mind apart, when you get, want to get down to real precision, then start seeing relationships in, in terms of bondings, and then you'll start to really understand them. Now, there's two things you should know about the if A then B postulate. It's got the word then in it. Well, the first thing you need to know about the then, that it's not, we're not using the word then in a temporal sense. We're not saying that if A, then, ten minutes later, B. We're not using then in that sense. We're using then in the sense of exist. If A exists, then B exists. There's no, no, it's not, there's no, no temporal gap between A and B. We're not using the word then in its temporal sense. We're using it in the connecting sense, then. It's a conjunction, then. Follow that? We're using it in the connecting sense not in the temporal sense. So when we say if A then B, it's a pure relationship. It's, there's no temporal sense in it. There's no time in the postulate. It's not, it's not a time postulate. There's no, no time implied in the then, if A then B. We're not saying that if A exists, then a certain time afterward B exists. We're saying if A exists, then B exists. They can both be existing simultaneously. <laughs> if A then B. If every time we see A, we see B. There's no, t there's no time in it. Get that? So the then is not temporal. And the other thing you need to know is that if A then B is a pure relationship postulate, it does not imply that A is the cause of B 
or it doesn't imply that B is the cause of A. It is not a causal situa relationship between A and B. It, when we say if A then B, we're not implying that A is the cause of B, or that B is the cause of A, or that not A is the cause of not B, or that not B is the cause of not A, or any other any other sequence, or any other combination of, of um, A, B, not A, not B relationships in the set. We're not implying anything causative when we say if A then B. We're simply saying when A exists, if A exists, then B exists. Every time we see A, we see B. And if we don't see B, we don't see A. And A is bonded to B. That's all we're saying. We're not, there's no causative. It's not a causative relationship. Get that in mind. Get that very, very clear. There's no causation here. Now, although the if A then B postulate doesn't imply any causation between the elements of the postulate, between the elements of the postulate, the, the, the relationship postulate as a postulate is a true postulate, and like any postulate, it is a causative consideration. So the whole postulate, if A then B, has a, uh, once postulated into the mind, into the psyche, um, is causative. It's causative upon the um, upon the individual and, and upon his surroundings, and, and so on. So, so, so get it get it quite clearly that the the the, um, the postulate itself is like any postulate is a causative consideration. But there's no causation when we say if A then B. There's no causation being implied between the elements of A and B within the postulate. That's the whole point I'm trying to make. Now, although there's no causation implied between the elements of an if A then B postulate, there is a necessity relationship between the elements and a relationship of sufficiency between the elements, which I'll uh, proceed to explain to you because you, you should you should know about them. When we postulate if A then B, we are either postulating that B, that the existence of B is a necessary condition for the existence of A, or we are postulating that the existence of A is a sufficient condition for the existence of B. Here are a couple of examples here to, to, to uh, separate those two out and, and to clarify what I mean by what I mean by the, the necessity bonding and the sufficiency bonding. First of all, the sufficiency bonding. Um, a man says to his son, he says, uh, if the weather is fine tomorrow, then we will have a picnic. Now, the relationship here, the postulate here, is if fine weather, then a picnic. Well, now, the man is saying, in essence, that the the fine weather is a sufficient condition for the picnic. In other words, that uh, if the weather is fine, then there will be a picnic tomorrow. Uh, the, 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 there may well be other things which are sufficient conditions for the picnic tomorrow, but uh, fine weather is certainly one of them. If the weather is fine, there will be a picnic tomorrow. He will take the, take the lad out for a picnic. So that is an example of sufficiency. If fine weather, then picnic. The fine weather is a sufficient condition for the picnic. Clearly, it's, it's not that the, the picnic is a necessary condition for the fine weather. That, is, that, that doesn't make any sense, does it? The fine weather is not a necessary condition. Sorry, the, the picnic is not a necessary condition for the fine weather. No, the, 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 the correct relationship there is a sufficiency relationship that the, uh, the fine weather is a sufficient condition for the picnic. OK on that one? You can see that is a, an example of sufficiency. Now let's give an example of, uh, of, of the necessity bonding. Uh, a young boy goes, starts off at school and he notices that um, all the other boys are wearing trousers and so is he. He notices that all the boys are wearing, are wearing, are wearing trousers and uh, he's in the frame of mind to establish his masculinity and he has this bright idea that, uh, well now, it seems that, uh, that all the males and all the boys are wearing, wearing trousers, so uh, it's, he, he might be able to establish his masculinity, which is something he, he really wants to do, 
So he says from he postulates if boy, then wearing trousers. That's it. That's his postulate. What he's do, he's making that postulate. The idea is that he's bonding his masculinity to the wearing of trousers in this in these circumstances, in order to establish his masculinity, because the trousers are a recognised and accepted male gender symbol in the society in which he lives. So he's bonding his uh, his masculinity to the existing gender symbol, the trousers. Get it? Now let's examine this in terms of sufficiency and necessity. Um, is the is being a boy under these circumstances, is being a boy a sufficient condition for wearing the trousers? Well no. No. And why not? Because it's being a boy that he's trying to establish. <laughs> you see that? It, it's, uh, he he feels a lack of establishment of his of his masculinity. It's the masculinity he's trying to establish by the wearing of the trousers. Now the correct relationship there it's a necessity bonding that the wearing of the trousers is a necessary condition for being a boy in his mind. But the relationship is if boy then wearing trousers with the with the necessity relationship between the wearing of the trousers and being a boy, that the wearing of the trousers is a necessary condition for being a boy. So there's an example of the uh, of the necessity relationship. Now, when you examine if A then B postulates, you'll find that uh, they're either sufficient, either either A is a sufficient condition for B, or B is a necessary condition for A. It's always going to be one or the other. It's always going to be one or the other. And sometimes, very, very rarely, it, it means both. Both will apply. I'll give you an example here that will, will both, and I'll explain how, under what circumstances you get both being, being applicable. Let's take our example of the, uh, the crows and the birds. If crow, then bird. Now that's a true relationship in this universe, on this planet. But um, certainly uh, being a crow is a sufficient condition for being a bird. There's no doubt about that. A crow is, a, is, is being a crow is sufficient condition for being a bird. But on the other hand, being a bird is a necessary condition for being a crow. You, you, you can't be a crow unless you're a bird, you see. <laughs> so being a, being a bird is a necessary condition for being a crow. Both of them apply. The, the crow is a sufficient condition, crow is sufficient for bird, and, and bird is necessary for crow. Now how does this come about? Well, it comes about because of the way we define a crow. We define a crow as within the class of a bird. A part of our definition of a crow is the fact that it, it is a bird. You see, it's a type of bird, it's a crow. Once we define a crow as a type of bird, we've put A within the class of B, and we've made the if A then B postulate in our definition. And uh, this shows up when we examine the postulate that uh, that we find that the if A then B, there's a sufficiency relationship there and a necessity relationship are both present. And we call this, it's known in logic, as a logical tautology. It's a tautology. If crow then bird is a logical tautology. And the, what we mean when we say it's a logical tautology, we mean the relationship is true because of the way we define A and the way we define B. Do you understand that? That is what we mean by a logical tautology. Now, I can prove that every time you, you find both a sufficiency and a necessity relationship in an FA then B postulate, I can prove it logically that it's, it's always then a logical tautology. Now, I've never seen, the, never seen the proof of this in any logical textbook, and I think my, my proof is, uh, must be quite original. And I suppose I should send it off to some logical journal somewhere, and it will no doubt get, get swept up and collected and written up one day in a logical textbook. But uh, I'll, maybe I'll get around to it one day. But certainly it, it is so, I can assure you, even though it doesn't appear in any of the logical textbooks. And I, I do have the proof tucked away amongst my research notes. It is a fact, I can assure you. 
but it is only something that only, only just marginally concerns us that you sometimes be looking in your psyche and you come across an if a then b relationship and you find that uh, that the when you take the relationship apart there's a, both a sufficiency and a necessity uh, relationship are, are there within your if a then b well just know that that it's true that this, this if a if a then b relationship in your psyche is true by logical necessity by the way you are defining a and b in your mind that as a person you are defining a and b that way and that's why it's coming out this way so it's it's valuable to you but it's it's quite rare it's quite rare nevertheless that you again you should understand it why the phenomena occurs when it does occur well that completes our subject of the single bonding and I wish that that was the end of the subject the universe would be a far better place if the if there was only the single bondings extent but now we introduce you to the uh, the demon the the evil demon of the piece is the double bonding the double bind now what is a double bind well a double bind is a single bonding plus its reverse when the single bonding if A then B the reverse of if A then B is if B then A so if we have a situation where if A then B maintains and coupled with if B then A then that is a double bonding a double bind we now have A bonded to B B bonded to A now this is a deadly situation this is a deadly situation it's something which you will not discover until you get into the subject of relationships and get them down to if A then B's. The, 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 the deadly nature of the double bind is not apparent until you get into the subject of relationships and break them down to if they're if A then B components. Then you begin to get into the double binds and see, see their awful nature. While you're skidding over the surface and just looking at general in human relationships, you don't spot the double bind. It's only when you get, you take the relationship, reduce it to its if A then B, and you suddenly look, realise, my God, there's a reverse is true too, and you, 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 then you realise the horror of what, you, what you're up against, the double bind, the double bonding. Now we've met the double bind in the postulate set. There's a double bind in when when games play becomes compulsive in the in the in the ordinary postulate set, in the to no goals package or any other goals package, in a goals package when we find a false identification between the elements of the goals package. Remember it? That's a double bind. Well, we can get a double bind in the postulate set in a relationship. And it is equally a deadly. It is equally entrapping, as you would expect. And very, very hidden. Just as hidden. The, the double bind is just as hidden in the relationship uh, in, in relationships as it is in the uh, in the in the gold packages just as hidden and just as deadly when I first came across the subject of um, the double bind in my in my research I called it the double lock on the mind the double lock on the mind because once a the double bind is extant the person is virtually trapped within a, within a situation which has a double lock on it. Well, what do I mean by a double lock? Well, I mean that <laughs> that one lock keeps the other. Lock A keeps lock B in place, and lock B keeps lock A in place. There's a double lock, and he can't get out. He can't unlock lock A because he's in because he's in lock B, and he can't unlock lock B because he's he locked in A. I'll give you an example of the, of the double bind, and you'll, you'll see the the, all, the sheer horror of the situation. And they do occur; they're very, very common in life. Double binds are relationship double binds. They're not at all unusual, but they're a great mystery, and people get caught in them. And a, and a, and a double bind can ruin your life. I can assure you, <laughs> many people have their life ruined by a double bind. I'll give you an example of one. Now, a young man leaves school and applies for a job and uh, he's told by the interviewer that um, that he can't be given a job because he's inexperienced so the young man says well now um, how do I get some experience and the interviewer says well the only way to get experience is to get a job which we can't give you because you're inexperienced 
and uh, that's the end of the interview and the young man staggers off into the into the in, into the daylight or into the night feeling completely crushed and unless this young man is 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 of particularly clear mental abilities uh, or is a student of logic or, or what have you he's going to feel absolutely defeated he, his mind is going to go around he's going to go around like a rat in a maze his mind is he's going to say now wait a minute um, I can't get a job because I'm inexperienced and the only way to get experience is to get a job which I can't get because I'm inexperienced so I need to get experience to get a job wait a minute and he starts in again and he goes round and round and round this thing well I need to get some experience but I can't get any experience because I haven't got a job and I can't get a job because I'm inexperienced and uh, I, I can't without the experience I can't get a job and without the job I can't get the experience so there's no way I, 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 I'm doomed I can't get I, I can't I can't move I'm stuck <laughs> yes that's right he is <laughs> the relationship here is and this is why he, he's like a rat in a maze the relationship is they say uh, if employable then experienced but the, and it's reverse if experienced, then employable. The effect of the two, uh, the, of the two postulates, the, the two relationships, is to reduce the set, the employable experience set, down to either both employable and experienced, or neither ex employable nor experienced. The, the, the classes of experienced and not employable and employable and not experienced don't exist in the set. The two postulates null, make those into null classes, you see. And the unfortunate young man is stuck in the class of neither experienced nor employable. And there's no way in the world he can get across to the class of both employable and experienced. Why not? Well, <laughs> the double lock is a double it's a double locking mechanism so you can't go from inexperience to experience because he's not employable and he can't go from not employable to employable because he's not experienced <laughs> you see that and uh, so he's so he so he's trapped he's trapped in the class of neither employable nor experience and there's no way in the world that he can get while those postulates are extant, while he's agreeing to those postulates. There's no way in the world that he can go across, get across from the class he's in, neither experienced nor employable, to the class of both employable and experienced. There's no way. The double bind simply locks him out. He's locked out. You see the viciousness of the mechanism. It's a double lock. It's a double locking device. And he's locked out. But much stronger than he will be locked out by bands of steel you know I mean there's um, but iron bars have got nothing to the to the power of a double bind when you start to get into some of these double binds in the human psyche you'll realize that um, the bands of steel have got nothing compared to these to the power of the double bind it's, it's truly a double lock on the mind well how does the young man let's finish the example off how could the young man break the double bind well he could um he could treat it as an incident in therapy, in Tron, and um, he, he could uh, uh, take it apart at level four, and, and uh, if he knew about bondings and so forth, he, he, could, he could get it apart, and uh, or at level five, eventually it would get, he'd get it apart. He'd keep working at it, and he'd get mighty curious about these relationships, these bondings. Eventually, he'd tumble what the hell was going on. But if you heard this tape, he'd get it apart, apart rather quickly if he knew about the FAMB postulates and uh, the subject of relationships that I'm talking about on this tape. He'd get it apart rather rather quickly. Now, as most people sometime in their life have been caught up with a double bind situation, and you see that this tape I'm giving you is, is covering useful material, covering you how to take a double bind apart what it consists of and how to get it apart very very quickly well the young man he only has to examine the interview and write down his his postulates that um, that, uh, that occurred during the interview and uh, he would quickly uh, quickly say well there's these two postulates if employable then experienced and if 
experience that in Friable. Bang, you can see it. Now, are both these postulates true? Is, is it true <laughs> that... Uh, that all those who are experienced are employable and all those who are employable are experienced. Now, is, is, it, is it true? Well, let's take these postulates one at a time. Let's take the postulate, if employable, then experienced. Well, now, is this a true postulate? Well, now, no, it's not. It can't be a true postulate. Why not? Well, if it were true that uh, all those who are employable are experienced, then no one would have a job. Because by necessity, everyone is inexperienced when they start their first job. You see that? So the postulate can't be a true postulate in our society. If, it were, if the postulate was true, no one would have a job in the society, because no one could ever get started at work, you see. But people do work, are working, therefore the postulate's false. So that, that's a false postulate. Now how about the other, how about the other postulate? if experienced, then employable. Well, this postulate is, is, is probably closer to being true, but there are some... Ex I mean, that, that can be true and, and, and cannot be true. Under certain circumstances it's true, and under certain circumstances it's not true. So we just have to say, well, that's OK, that postulate is. It depends upon the circumstances. Now, that's all right. There's nothing wrong with that one. But the, the postulate, if employable, then experience is a, is a lie. See, that, 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 that has to be false, that one. And once you see that that postulate is false, the double bind collapses. Once a young man could spot, you'd say, well, that, that's false, that's a lie. But they sold me a lie. They got me to agree to the, to the postulate if employable, then experience. That's a false postulate. Once he realised that they had hung a lie on him, he breaks out of the lie. Now the double bind becomes a single bind. And he's free. <coughs> so, see, the single bonding is not entrapping. He, 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 there's no, no entrapment of the single bonding. It's only the double bind that's the trap. So he walks out the trap. He just gets very furious about the employer and goes down and punches, or the, the interviewer would like to go down and punch him on the nose for, for trying to hang a lie on him. He'd been conned, in other words. He'd be very annoyed, and rightly so, too. Now, it's a strange thing about double binds, the entrapping effect of double binds, that when you examine them and take them apart, using the data I'm giving you on this tape, you always repeat, always find, that one of the postulates is a lie. There's always a lie involved in a double bind. You never find the if A then B postulate and its relationship, and its re sorry, and its reverse, are both true. Both of them could be false, but at least one of them is false, or maybe both of them. They can't both be true. You see that? They can't both be true. If they were both true, you wouldn't be trapped in anything. The fact that you're trapped, and you're, you're inconvenienced, you're emotionally disturbed by the situation, and you suffer a great loss of freedom, you, you feel you're walking, around in a, you're walking around in a trap, you feel you're in a prison, you feel, you, your mind feels like a, you feel like a rat in a maze, you're in a double bind, mate. Find it. You see that? And the fact that you're in this situation, one or the other or both of the postulates that you're subscribing to are false. One of the, or other of the postulates in the double bind are false. In other words, there's always a lie present in a double bind. And that is a very, very important datum. It's up to you to find where the lie is. Only the truth will free you from a double bind. One of the, one of the postulates is false in the double bind. It's false. There's a, there's a line there somewhere. There has to be. Just as the the double bind in the postulate set, you know, the postulates in, in the in the gold packages, there's always the, they're, they're always there's always a lie there. In the double binds there, and it's similarly in the relationship postulates. If there's a double bind in the relationships, in the in the if A then B relationship postulates, then one or other of the relationships is a lie. If they were both true, you wouldn't be trapped in anything. I can assure you, they were both true. But they can both be false. <laughs> so that, that's, that, that's the way it stands. That's, that's the position. Now, a double bind is deadly. It can ruin your life. Single bonding, 
okay double bind awful and you'll find that the some of the most st sticky awful incidents you've ever experienced in your life and ones that you've never really got away from a book contain double binds they probably contain more more than one so that they, they stick out like beacons on your time track they do a double bind if you're caught up in one you'll know all about it mate you won't have to search for them they'll come searching for you once you know what to look for <laughs> you're just listening to this tape if you understand what i'm talking about you probably and you, you haven't You've got incidents that are unresolved from the subject of double bind. These will be these 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 incidents will be wrapped around your neck right now while you're listening to this tape. The incident will come searching you out. It will if you understand. Once you understand the mechanism, the incident will come up, come and search you out, and pleading with you to get it get to resolve it. Take the liar part to get free of the double bind. Okay, so much for the double bind. You understand the mechanism. You understand how to take it apart. All right. Well now. This subject, let's go now from theory, let's look at, look at a few practical aspects of this. How would you know, how could you find if you had a bonding in your mind? Very, very simple. It's a very, very simple test for a bonding. If I is bonded to B in your mind, then every time you think of I, you will think of B. It's as simple as that. If every time you think of a person wearing a dress, you think of a girl, and I can assure you that the bonding, if person wearing dress, then girl, you are subscribing to that bonding. You are subscribing to that posture. You are subscribing to that relationship. See that? There's the test. It's an infallible test. It will never let you down. It's a very simple test. There are, there are more complicated tests, but you don't need to know them. So I won't bother to give them to you. The simple test is infallible, and it will never let you down. If every time you think of A, you will also think of B. Okay, if that happens, and if A then B is extant. Now what do you have to do about it in therapy? Nothing. Nothing. Unless it hangs fire. Nothing. Now get me on this one. You don't do anything about these relationship postures in therapy unless they hang fire. You just do the steps as I've given them. You do level one, you do level two, you do level three, and you do level four, and you do level five. And you don't concern yourself with the relationship postulates unless they hang fire. Now, the only place they're going to hang fire eventually, they might show up at level two, level three, and you, you note them, you do take a bit of charge off them, Take a bit of charge off at level two, a bit more charge at level three, and level four you get a bit more charge off them, and level five then no more charge comes off, but the thing's still hanging fire. Okay, you've got right to the top of level five, you've, you've nailed the to know goals package, you, you've run a lot of junior goals packages, you've run a lot of junior universe, and this damn double bind, this, this damn relationship is still hanging fire. All right, what can you do about it? Well, we can erase them out of the mind. Now, any if A then B postulate can be erased from the mind by making it the subject matter of the to know goals package at level 5C. I'll give it to you again. Any if A then B postulate can be erased from the mind by making it the subject matter of the to know goals package at level 5c but don't make a thing out of it look 999 out of a thousand of the bondings in your mind are going to come apart in routine therapy they're simply going to fall apart under the impact of the of the levels of the therapy there's just the odd one or two that are going to hang fire and you need to know how to erase them and the way to erase them, you make them the subject matter of the to know goals package at level 5C. Now, why does that erase them? It erases them like it, because any postulate can be made the subject matter of the to know goals package it, at level 5C. It's an existence, isn't it? Any existence can be made the subject matter of that goals package and is erasable at level 5C. 
So that's the way you that's the way you you, you would take them apart at level at level five C. They the, in other words the technology the final technology for the erasure of uh, relationships if A then B prospers from the mind and get them in the put them in the for God's sake put them in the form of the A then B before you attempt to erase them. Put them in the if A then B form and then erase them at level five C. One of the last things you do in therapy, by the way, will be these these sticky hanging fire if A then B relationships that are hanging fire still. And you just knuckle down on the last things you do before the whole lot blows at level before the whole of level five blows will be to get rid of these sticky hanging fire if A then B relationships in your psyche. One exception to to this general rule that I've given you, they, they can all be erased at level five C with the exception of those relationships that you hold in common with your body. And now these will almost exclusively be relationships of a certain type on the subject of sex. Now I can tell you what they will be, so you, so you won't be surprised when you come across them. There's a double bind between the, between the junior universe of masculinity and the postulate must sex and a double bind between the junior universe of masculinity and the postulate mustn't be sexed. There is a double bind between the junior universe of femininity and the postulate must be sexed, and there's a junior universe, I'm sorry, there's a double bind between the junior universe of femininity and the postulate mustn't sex. Now they are they are the main ones. They are, they are the main ones. You can erase them out of your psyche, but the body will still be subscribing to them. So don't be surprised if they continue to hang fire. Just become aware that they're hanging fire because of, the, of your, their body relationships. They're part of your body psyche as well as yours. So just separate them out, and then they'll go. Otherwise, they'll go on forever. Now, they are the only exceptions that I know of. There could be, some people may have some relationships on the subject of eating that may also hang fire, but I haven't come across them in my, in my psyche. But they could occur too. But so, so look, look out for those as well. You could hold some uh, relationships in common with your body on the subject of eating. Okay, well, that about wraps it up. That about wraps it up. I wish you luck with you with your subject of relationships and bondings. I wish you uh, wish you good luck in the erasure of these uh, relationships from your psyche in, in therapy. Bye bye for now.